Neurosurgery is interesting in the sense that we have rules in many different neurologic diseases, but they're all different. So multiple sclerosis, for example, since we don't know the etiology of the disease, we have no real role to play in terms of prevention or treatment. However, we can treat some of the symptoms of the disease. So a lot of patients with multiple sclerosis are spastic. We can insert pumps that allow for a medication called baclofen to reduce spasticity. Epilepsy is different. Uh, epilepsy is generally treated with medication. However, we can now identify the areas of epileptic focus in the brain and actually resect them. So if medication fails, sometimes go in that direction. Stroke prevention, if we identify someone who's vulnerable to have a stroke, for example, they have a TIA or a transient neurologic deficit, and we see that they have st uh, stenosis of the carotid arteries, we can go in and put a stent, actually through the, we can go through the groin and put a stent in there and then prevent stroke in that way. It may be easy technically, but sometimes it's difficult in terms of decision making. For example, if you know that someone has a 5% risk of stroke and you know that the procedure has a 2% risk of complication, do you apply it? Depends on the patient's age, the patient's activities, so many different factors. So neurosurgery always has a difficulty in getting it done technically and a difficulty in terms of decision making. I think if we understand etiologies, we, we develop procedures to treat them. In addition, I think computers have really played a huge part in neurosurgery. One of the interesting things about the brain is it's got a fixed relationship to the skull. So if you can mark something on the skull, a computer can figure out where in the brain it is relative to that marker on the skull and you can be very, very precise in, in, in finding what you want to find. So the Mazor is a new robot which we've purchased and really what it does is it improves accuracy and safety when we place screws into the spine. Turns out that it, there's about a 5% risk of being outside the area we want to be in when we put a screw in. I don't know if it sounds like a big or a small number to you but it's, it, we decided it was too big a number and what the robot does is it takes the human element out of that and, and brings down the accuracy, brings up the accuracy I should say to 99 plus percent. Once you've decided that a fusion, for example, is the right procedure to have done for your spine, and that's the hard part, of course, once you've decided that, then it's all about executing the fusion, and this improves the execution. It definitely, you know, it's really, it's, the analogy would be, for example, um, an airplane pilot. You know, they, they don't fly planes anymore, they monitor computers, and if a computer breaks, you better be a good pilot or the, you're in trouble, right? Same thing with us. We don't do anything. We don't ever forfeit the um, procedure to the, to the robot. We're always looking, double checking, does this make sense? Um, so there's a lot of checks and balances. But I think overall, there's very little that you lose and a lot that you gain. Well, I think the risk is, is mitigated quite a bit by the robot. It, literally, the chance of missing your target is point three percent or something incredibly small like that. The reason we can offer it here is that, um, and that and that it's not offered in a lot of other places is because it's very expensive and so it doesn't make sense from a cost-benefit analysis if that's what the hospital is doing. This hospital bought it based on quality. I said to the hospital this, this is a quality improvement we can make, it's expensive, do you want to go for it? And they said yes. Well, keeping up is not an issue because, as you can imagine, these companies make money off these products and so they're going to put them in our laps every day. The interesting question is a balance that every surgeon has to go through and that is, okay, a patient comes to me, I've been in practice 22 years, they think I'm very experienced. What they don't necessarily know is I've only done this new technique three times. So how do you subject your personal learning curve to a patient? That's a really difficult decision. You know, as a surgeon, we need to learn new things, otherwise we go nuts from boredom. On the other hand, is it fair to subject a learning curve to the patient? That's a balance we always have to, to, to deal with every single day.
slowly and surely. You know, everyone's different. I am someone that embraces new tech. Personally, I am someone who embraces new technology slowly. I like to watch a few times. I'm a, I like to get in late, and I like to be pretty convinced that I can do it before I do it. There, are, you know, there's other things now available. There are virtual labs, so you can practice. But to a certain to a certain extent, there's always that learning curve, and uh, and I also think it's important to be transparent with the patient. Let them know, hey, this is my fourth one, but I feel comfortable doing it. Is that okay with you? To me, I think you have to balance life, and I think you have to spend a percentage of your time, a, a real allocated percentage of your time, to learning new things and trying new things. Because I think the, as I said before, you get bored if you don't do it. But if you but if you balance too much time to that, if you're doing something new all the time, then you go crazy from anxiety.